name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Today's gospel uh, that we heard just a few moments ago uh, is a portion of St. John's record of the Last Supper. And you may or may not be aware of this, but that, that John's record of the Last Supper is, is quite extensive. Uh, in fact, uh, it covers chapters 13 through 17 in his gospel. And uh, those of you who may have or may remember um, a red letter edition of the Bible, of the, of the gospels, that those chapters 13 through 17 are almost all red letters. Because all of that is where John records what Jesus said and spoke and taught uh, at, uh, at the Last Supper. Um, and so again, that, uh, that account by, uh, by John of the Last Supper is a lot longer than the, in the other three Gospels. And again, you may recall that John, as he records the Last Supper, he records the foot washing. Jesus washed, washed the disciples' feet. But uh, John does not record the institution of the Lord's Supper. The other three Gospels do record the institution of the Lord's Supper, but they don't include the, uh, the foot washing. So uh, these Gospels uh, cover a lot of territory, but not all of them cover the same, same things. And one, one way to sort of say this is that there are the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and Synoptic means, you know, the Greek words means one eye. That basically those three Gospels, the synoptics, uh, they're basically pretty similar. They, most of them tell us some of the same events and teachings that Jesus gave. But John is different. He recorded other things that Jesus did, and especially the things uh, that, that he said. So there's the synoptic Gospels, and then there's John's Gospels, significantly different in what they uh, record of Jesus acts and his teachings. And the thing about the Gospel of John, uh, all four of the evangelists and all four of the Gospel writers have traditionally or historically have a symbol for them. And the symbol for John is an eagle. And that's because, at least as I've uh, understood it, is that John's theology, uh, the things that John uh, records, especially about Jesus' teaching, uh, his theology soars like an eagle. It's kind of, I don't know, sort of on a different level in, in some senses. Um, one way to think about it, at least for me, is to think is that, that John's account, what he recorded of Jesus' teachings and his actions is uh, more, and I don't want to push this too far, but more philosophical, more ethereal, maybe, more more spiritual, if you can use that, that kind of word, uh, than the synoptic gospels. Um, the synoptic gospels are more talked about the facts of Jesus' life and ministry, whereas John kind of goes a little bit deeper sometimes than that. For example, uh, about Jesus' birth. Uh, that's, uh, that, that event is recorded in, in both Matthew and Luke, and they're mainly concerned with the facts, okay? Some of you are maybe old enough to remember Dragnet, you know, sorry, Friday, you know, just the facts, ma'am, just the facts. Uh, and so that's what the synoptic gospels are most concerned about, and those are important for us to have. I mean, they talk about, you know, the angels coming and announcing to Mary and, and, and to Joseph and uh, the inn and the shepherds and the angels saying all that sort of thing, the facts. John does not record uh, the uh, event of Jesus' birth. But remember how he begins his gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and came and dwelt among us. So, again, he sort of goes behind the facts a little bit in the words that, uh, of Jesus that he, that he records. So, and another kind of thing, you know, John, is, is, sometimes it's more symbolic uh, John is the one that records Jesus' I am sayings. I am the good shepherd. Look, I am the gate. I am the light. Those kinds of things. Yeah, a little bit deeper than, than just the facts, ma'am. Just the facts. And so as I took a look at the 
the gospel reading for today, it seemed to me that John's style, of course, it's John's gospel, of course, uh, from the reading today, his, his style uh, or his approach uh, seems to be a play in what he records of Jesus' words today. Uh, to begin with in the gospel, Jesus said, a little while and you will see me no longer. And again a little while and you will see me. So some of his disciples said to one another, what is this that he says to us? A little while and you will not see me. And again, a little while and you will see me And because I'm going to the Father. So they were saying, what does he mean by a little while? We do not know what he's talking about. But we do. <laughs> at least on the surface because we can look back and see what actually happened. And so at least seemingly what Jesus is saying to them, okay, you know, it's going to be a little while, and you're not going to see me. That's when he's it's three days in the tomb. Now they're not going to see him. But then when he rises, then he has a number of resurrection appearances to those disciples. And so that's when he says, that, but then you will see me again. Okay? But then continuing in today's gospel reading, <clears throat> when uh, the disciples said, we don't know what he's talking about, uh, Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him. So he said to them, is this what you're asking yourselves? What I meant by saying a little while and you will not see me. And again, a little while and you will see me. Truly, truly I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. The world that crucified Jesus. Huh? You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. And that caught me a little bit uh, because if that's what Jesus was talking about, the business about not seeing him when he's in the tomb, three days, and then a little while later, after those three days, seeing him again in his, in his appearances after his resurrection, if, if that's what he was talking about when Jesus said that your just sorrow will turn to joy, the question is, where was that joy? that Jesus said they would have when they saw him. And we take a look at the, uh, the accounts of, uh, of Jesus' resurrection from all four of the Gospels. First of all, in, in uh, John chapter 20, this is where he records, uh, he records the, the resurrection. <clears throat> and uh, there, uh, Mary Magdalene, this is where it starts out, where Mary Magdalene goes to the tomb uh, and you know, finds that the, the stone was rolled away and all of that. Um, and then um, Peter and John also then went to the tomb. This is what, what John records. Um, and then uh, it, after that, after Peter and John had been there and looked in the tomb, they didn't find you know, Jesus there. And then John records, then the disciples went back to their homes. <laughs> okay, that's all it says. Okay, after they went and saw the empty tomb, they just kind of went back to their homes. Doesn't say a whole lot about any kind of joy that they experienced there. And then, uh, after a while, after that happens, then Mary Magdalene goes back and she tells the disciples what she had seen and Jesus uh, meets her as she's going back. And then uh, what, it, what it says here, uh, what, what John again records, is, and Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that, she, that he had said these things to her. And it doesn't give any kind of re reaction or response from the disciples. Okay? So again, not a whole lot of indication that there was joy on the part of the, uh, of the disciples. But then again, John continues <clears throat> right after that. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. It seems to me, it strikes me as a, a bit of an understatement. They were glad. Jesus said that they would have much joy when they saw him again. But... They were glad, is what John says. So again, I just don't see a whole lot of record on the part of the disciples having joy when they saw him uh, in his resurrection appearances. 
Matthew, of course, records the uh, resurrection as well in chapter 28, the last chapter of his gospel. And uh, here, this is when, uh, first of all, says Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, they, they go to the tomb to, to uh, prepare his body with the spices and all of that, uh, prepare him for burial. And then it says that they got there and there was an angel there. And uh, the angel said to the, woman, to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who is crucified. He's not here, for he has risen as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you, before the disciples, to Galilee. There you will see him. So the women departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy. Now it's the women who had joy here, huh? The women, Mary Magdalene and uh, the others who were there with them. <coughs> and behold, as they were going, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Okay, here's Jesus appeared to them after his resurrection. Where's the joy? Doesn't say anything about joy. In fact, some of them even doubted what was going on. Luke, of course, also records uh, the, the, the resurrection appearances. And this is in, in chapter, 20, chapter 24 of, of Luke's gospel. And then, uh, again, it's uh, the women went to the tomb. And as they were, and, and behold, there were two men in there, two, two, two uh, angels. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified on the third day. And they, the women, remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. But these words seemed to them to the disciples and the rest, an idle tale. And they did not believe them. <laughs> okay? Think of this news came back. We saw the Lord. He's, he's risen. And, you know, most of them didn't believe it. Okay? An idle tale. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. Okay? He went and saw the tomb was empty. He just went home. And it says that he marveled, you know, probably kind of wondering what's going on here, but he marveled. Doesn't say anything about he or the other disciples having any joy. And then there's Mark. And now Mark and his telling of the uh, resurrection is really different from all, from all the rest. Um, because here he talks about uh, when they went, uh, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and Salome, they went to the tomb, and uh, they, found, uh, they found the tomb empty there. Uh, and then what Mark records about that is that uh, he said to them, the angel said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who's crucified. He has risen. He's not here. You know, all, same kind of things for all of the Gospels. See the place where they laid him, but go. Tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you'll see him, just as he told you. And they, the women, went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Now that's where most uh, biblical scholars say Mark's gospel originally ended. Uh, later on, some words were added there to kind of, kind of fill in the gap there. But apparently, where when Mark really finished his gospel, <laughs> the women, you know, they didn't say anything to anybody. And so again, no kind of joy that you see there anywhere. Where's the joy? That's what Jesus said. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn to joy. Didn't see anything of that recorded in any of the resurrection accounts of the Gospels. But what I'd like to do is to jump ahead just a little bit in, in, in Luke's Gospel.
Uh, chapter 24, the, he records the resurrection, you know, and they report to the women and they don't get excited. And then Luke records the road to Emmaus, you know, those uh, two on the way to Emmaus. And Jesus appeared to them and finally they just realized who he was. They went back and told the disciples that they had, that they had seen the Lord. But again, no sign of really joy on their part. But the very last verses of Luke's gospel, this is what Luke writes. And Jesus led the disciples out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple blessing God. Finally, finally the disciples experienced joy. Not just ordinary joy, if there's such a thing, but great joy. At our uh, area pastors' uh, meetings, which we have once, once a month, uh, we always have, have some kind of a Bible study there. And our Bible study leader is Pastor Nielsen, and I know you're familiar with him because he served here for a month and a half or something like that. Uh, he leads, uh, leads our Bible study and does a great job at that. And in this, the one last week, he took a look at this Ascension account from Luke. And he pointed out to us that this at the Ascension account was the only time in any of the Gospels where the disciples experienced great joy. The only time. Again, all the other accounts I read to you, there's no mention of the disciples having any kind of joy. Sometimes they even didn't even believe. Huh? They doubted on an idle tale. There was no joy there. But at the ascension, when they saw Jesus there, then they had great joy. The only other people in the Gospels who are said to have experienced great joy were the Magi, the wise men, when they saw the star reappear in Jerusalem. And then the other one, I think I mentioned earlier, one of the Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, when they uh, saw the empty tomb, they experienced great joy. But not the disciples. The only time in the Gospels where the disciples are said to have experienced great joy was there when they saw Jesus at his ascension. So apparently something, I have no idea what it is, but something happened for those disciples when they saw him as he ascended into heaven. And that was 40 days after they saw him in his resurrection appearances. They had seen him in his resurrection appearance before, but, you know, never recorded they had great joy. But here at the Ascension, they saw Jesus and finally, something happened. Finally, we're told that they experienced great joy. Again, I have no idea what that is. But whatever it was, it seems that something finally clicked for those disciples. Because you're aware that so many times the disciples had no idea what was going on. They even said stupid things sometimes. Everything was going over their head most of the time. Even, even Peter, I mean, my goodness, he makes a confession that Jesus is the Christ. And then when Jesus says, yeah, you're right, uh, but I'm going to suffer and die. And Peter says, oh, that's not going to happen to you, Lord. And so Jesus calls him Satan. And get behind me, Satan. I mean, things just went over their head. At the ascension, though, something, whatever it was, finally clicked. It all came together for them at that time. And what it is, is you know, Jesus' ministry, his whole ministry, his teachings about what he was going to be and do. Everything he said, again, they didn't get it. They just didn't get it. But now they finally did. It all finally came together, apparently, at Jesus' ascension. That's where, when Jesus said, and again, you will see me, apparently at the ascension is when they really and truly saw Jesus. They had seen him before in his appearances, post-resurrection appearances. But still it didn't click. But here, finally, it did, and they truly 
saw Jesus. Now, in, in the immediate context of Jesus' words in the gospel for today, about a little while, you won't see me, and again, a little while, you will see me, the immediate context seems to be you know, his burial and then his resurrection appearances. Okay? And they won't see him while he's buried. His resurrection appearances, they, they will see him. But when Jesus spoke, and I'm not just here in this text, anywhere in any of the Gospels, when Jesus spoke, his, his words were intended not just for the people at that time only. I mean, it was but not for them only, but others as well. Because we read again in uh, in John's in uh, John's gospel, if we go back uh, back to chapter 17 in his gospel, and that's his high priestly prayer. It's still in the upper room, and the whole chapter is Jesus' prayer. Uh, he prays before he knows he's going to be arrested and crucified, and first he prays for himself that he may give glory to the Father. Then he prays for those around him, his disciples. And then is what, what John records these words of Jesus after he prays for the disciples. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. So he says, now Jesus prays for people who will come after the disciples, for those who will believe because of the disciples witness and testimony and so that's you and me huh? so Jesus is there praying for us because we are the ones who believe because of the apostles testimony and so putting all this together and, and understanding you know how somewhat different John's gospel is and, and, and he records the words of Jesus but he kind of uses them a little bit differently maybe uh, not just facts, but something beyond the facts, something more. And so, could there be, <clears throat> excuse me, could there be more than initially meets the eye in these words of Jesus from the gospel today? Jesus said, a little while and you will see me no longer, and again a little while and you will see me. Now, we do not see Jesus, not with our eyes. Okay, we have the eyes of faith we can speak of, but not with our physical eyes. We don't see the bodily Jesus. But when we do see Jesus with our eyes, our physical eyes, and that, of course, will be at his return and our resurrection then we will see Jesus. When we see Jesus at that time with our eyes, we, like the disciples when they saw Jesus at his ascension, then when we see him, we will see him with more than our physical eyes. Just as happened to the disciples at Jesus' ascension. When we see Jesus then at his return, and when he raises us from the grave, we will see everything, just as those disciples did. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 13, for now, talking about this life, we see in a mirror dimly, but then, at his return, then we will see face to face. And John in his first letter, chapter 3, writes, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. When we see Jesus, with our physical eyes, when he returns, and we are raised from the grave, then everything we have experienced in this life, 
everything that has been good in this life and everything that has been bad. All the things that we expected to experience and the things we never expected to experience. All the things in this life that we have desired and all the things in this life that we have dreaded. All of our sorrows and all of our joys in this life. When we see Jesus with our eyes at his return, then all of that will click. It will all come together. Then we will see everything about Jesus and realize that he, together with the Father and the Holy Spirit, see how they have been involved and guiding and with us in all of those experiences of this life. In this life we see in a mere dimly. We don't know what's going on half the time. We wonder, God, why did you let this happen to me? Or why does this go on? Or that sort of thing. All these questions and no reason and no answer. Sometimes we can say, yeah, Lord, I don't understand why you've blessed me so. And I certainly don't deserve it. Finally, we will see Jesus, not just with our physical eyes, but we will see everything about Jesus. Then we will see face to face. And we, like those disciples when they had that experience, we will have great joy, great joy. And that will be our experience forever great joy forever when we see Jesus with our physical eyes when he comes again. And so because I think we can read those words of Jesus thusly, a little while you will see me no longer. We don't see Jesus now. Huh? Again a little while you will see me. This life really is a little while compared to eternity. And we will see him. And we, like the disciples, will have great joy. And it will be forever. And so, looking at the words of Jesus that way, I think we can, with John, as he concludes the concluding words to the book of Revelation, we can pray with all sincerity and honesty, Come, Lord Jesus when we will have great joy forever. Now may the peace and the power of God, which must pass through all of our human understanding, your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus now and always. Amen.